uh, about television and, and film writing, and things like that. And uh, Brett and Kia will join us. Samuel Grant Williams, uh, Ian Quirkern. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> they had me listed as, moder as moderator, so I thought the one thing I had to do was like introduce you. <laughs> My job's done now. Um, you want to talk about TV? Your experience in TV first? or? Sure, because there isn't much of it. <laughs> I mean, I, um, yeah, I've done very, very little. It was, I never really pursued it, to tell you the truth. So it was only when things sort of kind of fell into my lap, which has rarely happened, um, that, uh, that I did it. Uh, so HBO for a while was interested in me writing a series. I wasn't so interested. And then at one point, finally I did write a pilot, which they didn't do. And then, uh, I mean, they, you know, yeah, they didn't uh, pick it up. And then uh, I, through that, I met Tom Fontana, who actually really liked the pilot. And so he did a short-lived series for a while called The Jury and asked me to do an episode because we had conversations about our experiences on a jury. So he thought I would want to do that, which, did and then I. Adam Rapp did that too? Was he on that show with you? I have no idea no, because I only did. <laughs> I know Adam, but oh, I have yeah. no idea because he's in this one episode. Oh, you and it was very them? short lived. No, yeah, no, no, no. It was really short lived, just like this summer. And then I did a, an episode of The Wire, and um, which were two different, ex very different experiences because the jury was brand new and I kind of did whatever I wanted. And Tom Batan is very laid back. And, uh, and, and one was network, right? And the other was HBO. So that's probably yes. as well. Yeah. Well, no, actually, I think the main difference uh, was that, um, besides that I could write fuck into the script, <laughs> was that um, it's somebody who was very laid back. It was sort of like gave me a vague idea to do whatever you want, as opposed to The Wire, which was the fourth of, fifth season, of five seasons. And they had a strong idea of what it was, and so... Which season was it that you were It was for? season four. Is that the kids in the school? Yes, oh, which that's is the one actually, loves. which yeah. is why uh, they asked me to do it, because my um, most widely produced play is called Breath Boo, which is about uh, girl gangs, and so they thought, uh, he read my um, uh, script date and time, and they really liked it and asked me to do it, and I... Didn't watch the show, and because I didn't really watch TV much, and I told him, and he said that's okay. We can, and so I wrote that episode. I mean, it, and in that case, I was in a, a room that came out of all the world. Okay. And, and they had a lot of novelists in that uh, room. Yeah, well, right? I mean, Richard not Price, like, I think. Yes, he did yeah. write for them, but he wasn't when I was there. He wasn't because he wasn't on that episode, so he wasn't one of them. Okay. That's great. Yeah. yeah. I you're asking me questions, but you have so much more experience. You should be the one talking. Well, my TV experience was um, I had a pilot picked up by Noah Hawley who created Fargo. So that was a, a great experience. I mean, it's kind of like with film, too. It really It's dependent on the people you're working with, like the experience you have from it. I mean, I think I was most disappointed that, like, they, they were the smartest theater people. TV and film because I'd always heard that like you know we're so much smarter than them. We don't make money, but we're smarter. So uh, I was really disappointed that they make money and they're smarter. Than they are. Um, but no, Noah was great. It was an incredible experience with Noah. He kind of guided me through the pilot and helped me develop it. And it was just this random weird thing about professional wrestling. Was it was called yeah. It was called uh, a woman comes down from New York and like inherits it from her father and like runs it. But it didn't get on the air. Didn't sell ABC. Oh, that's such a cool. I know, and now they have a women's wrestling show that like every playwright I know is writing for it, like Nick Jones and um, all of them. But uh, anyhow, it didn't. Uh, it was before Noah did Fargo, so he wasn't like he, he hadn't won the Emmys and stuff. Now he could probably sell like. See, I never watched TV, so all I know is there was a movie called Fargo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was a weird experience. He was talking. He was talking. He was going through the experience as he was making the show as we were trying to sell the other show. And he said that basically, like, the Coen brothers just didn't respond to emails or anything. It's like, they, they really had nothing to do with it. Um, and he just did his own thing. It just had to be kind of in the tone of 
the, the movie, essentially. Uh -huh. And then now it's doing, it's doing really well. It's a great show. Um, but no, my, the, so the good experience I had was, in, in terms of TV, was with that pilot, developing it, developing it with him, uh, with ABC, and then taking it around. And I think, you know, everyone passed on it eventually. Um, and uh, then after that, I had a horrible experience in TV where I broke for reality TV for like three years. Um, in, in a show I won't mention. Um, but uh, I, I literally faked an illness to get out of my contract at the end of that. Wow. Yeah, is this, where are they, I might have breached a contract. Uh, they're not watching. Um, but, um, but yeah, so it, I think you can't say an anecdote. It's uh, uh, there's so too many. secret. Yeah. It's too I mean, it was secret. completely fake. It was all fake. And I'll say there's horrible people on both sides of the camera. So it's like we weren't, we weren't exploiting, we were all exploiting each other, I think. But I was basically, as a writer, what I would do is I'd write an outline. It's about 11 to 12 pages of exactly what they were going to do. You couldn't write dialogue because they weren't actors. Um, and everything was fake, and they had very weird rules. It was for Discovery Channel. It, it was actually, um, uh, uh, what said, uh, Amish Mafia. So uh, there is no Amish Mafia. It's completely fake. Um, I, I shouldn't say any of this. <laughs> I actually, actually do have one little question. No, there, there, probably, there might be one. I don't know. I, I don't know. I'm looking at the camera now. It's like a lawyer. It's just about to sue me. Yeah. I do have one little question. Um, because... This also comes from because uh, I represent the I represent the dramatist guild, which I am. Oh yeah. Everyone should join. So my question regarding the writers guild: Did you, as a reality writer, did you get paid union rates? It was that's an issue. No, yeah. you know, I negotiated my own contract, and the best thing I had was the fact that I didn't want to do it. So they kept like giving me better and better terms, but there was no union at that time for reality TV. Yeah, now they're trying to create. So they were trying to create it for you still. Yeah, it? I didn't get paid probably nearly as much as I should have, uh -huh. but um, I think it was like a couple thousand a week. Um, but you need a separate union. Separate there, there's no, there's, there was no union. I know, I know. Yeah. The but now, the, to but now they're trying to create one. They're separate to, from the writer's guild? Um, or, or I think they're trying, trying to go through the WGA. Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And then like, kind of be it. represented yeah. through that. <laughs> um, but that was a weird experience, but I mean, I don't think anyone will ever realize how hard people actually worked on that show and actually really worked to make it good, which you know it wasn't at all. Um, but uh, like my mom couldn't even watch it. Like she, she I think she watched the first episode. And she was like, "Well, it's not really my thing." You know, I was like, "You don't have to watch it. It's fine. It's fine." Um, but um, it was, that is the worst thing when your mom can't even watch. It. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's not good. It's not good. It's, um, but it was it was it was its own experience, you know. I learned a lot about structure, and then for TV, what I found interesting is like you're really in terms of structuring like a pilot or structuring something that you're selling to network TV or even a reality show is you're selling products. So everything is pushing toward the act break, the five act breaks, which you're trying to sell the five uh, sets of commercials essentially. Mm -hmm. You know, so you're almost like um, getting people just to stay watching so they might buy something. You know, whereas HBO is a completely different. Beast, you know, I'm assuming where you can just write, it, it's much more linear. You don't have to break it up as much. It's not just these little acts that kind of lead to a climax type of thing. Or a uh, cliffhanger, sort of. Yeah. Um, I mean, it was, because I went into it so raw, because I hadn't done TV before except for that one uh, pilot, which that was for commercial TV. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm not talking about, well, the, not the pilot, because that was HBO, but I mean that the jury, uh, the funny thing, what I remember about it, I mean, I must have thought it, obviously I must have thought about structure because of the commercials, but I don't remember that. What I remember is um, Tom Fantana gave me this vague idea, which was very political, so, which I really appreciate because he knows I like to write political stuff, yeah. and so it was kind of right up my alley, and, um, and then I kind of did whatever I wanted. I don't know quite what happened at the end because I didn't really watch it. <laughs> but um, but he was sort of yeah whatever I wanted to do. Whereas with the uh, jury, um, I was down there for two and a half days in the room, and they knocked out the beats. Which you know I was sort of first of all I was the only female in the room, and except for the uh, um, assistant who was an Asian. Man, I'm the only person of color, but um, but I was actually much more aware of being the only female in that case because the testosterone was intense. Yeah. Um, but uh, 
I mean, they were very respectful of me, but in the end, they didn't really were interested in my ideas about these. Of course, they shouldn't have been because I don't know the show. And, um, but they were very kind and respectful and very nice. Um, but ultimately, so I left there with 41 weeks to do a 59 minutes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, I was thinking, this is why I can never keep up with this show. There's so much information. <laughs> but, um, but it was fun, actually, because even with what seems like, so no, they didn't say anything about first act, second act. And as a matter of fact, it wasn't even like they gave me an order. They just said, in 59 minutes, I have to get all this information out. So it was kind of fun um, in something with, um, with so many, uh, I don't know if I would say rules, but, but it was like I had to get this in, so it doesn't seem to allow a lot of freedom. But it was, it was creative the I, way I did it, so it was kind of fun. I find the film especially, I, film, I find it's much more comparable to poetry, actually, huh. than um, really theater. You know, I mean, a play is more like a novel. I never, know, I never want to know what's going to happen next, you know, uh -huh. in a play, when I'm writing a play. Uh -huh. But in film, you have to know every single thing, you know, because it's all, for to a degree, too, like every minute is money. You know, uh -huh. every single page costs so much money, and you have, um, you have to get all, like you said, you have to get all the information in in a certain amount of time. And you know, also, this was an interesting thing that I never thought of before until I got into that room was, um, there's a little uh, math thing going on because oh, yes. this, yeah, because this actor has seven episodes, this actor has nine episodes, so they have to say how to use those actors, uh, you know, in uh, to get their correct amount of episodes over the season. So there's that calculation, which I hadn't thought of before. It's, I mean, so much of it's money, you know, um, with all of that stuff. Have you, yeah, yeah. Have you had experience in film? Have you, have you written? Screenplays or no, I, <laughs> I, I this is why I don't know. If I ever do such a thing. I uh, did uh, uh, once a um, kind of well-respected uh, filmmaker wanted me to work on something, which was a great idea. But um, I don't know if I could do film because I had trouble with assholes. <laughs> <laughs>
first dibs at the Reverend adaptation of my novel. Of course, so, yeah. yeah. No, I have you. So have you ever tried to adapt any of your work before? Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, my experience with that was really interesting because well, I mean I had an incredible director. She was so nice and wonderful. She was James Franco's uh, assistant director. Mm -hmm. So this was her first feature, and um, I worked on a feature with her because she saw one of my plays, which they're making next year, called Pretty Near Perfect, on a much bigger budget. But this, I had this smaller play that had been kicked around a couple times, and it did get made once as a movie because I think someone's like cattle died because of a drought or something. Um, and, and she's like, I think we could do this like really cheap and really quick with the same crew we're using for the next one. Um, and she did it, and it, it was amazing, mm -hmm. you know? And one thing she did, she just like, she brought in the smartest people she knew. And like so many people owed her favors, because if you've been on a film set, you know everything an AD does, and all the shit that they have to eat. Um, can we say shit on how Well, you said fuck, so I can say shit. Uh, oh. We'll find out soon. Uh, yeah, can't say. We can't say that? Oh, no. All right, it's well, the we, internet! We can't say shit and we can't say fuck. I didn't even yeah, think about so that. Okay, I forgot. <laughs> as long as we stop saying shit and fuck, we'll be fine. Um, uh, but anyhow, um, yeah, so it's like, it, it was a really kind of wonderful experience a lot of people don't seem to have in film, but I, I feel like it's a better experience the less money that's involved. I bet. The more that's money that's involved, the harder it gets, because like even on the next one, it's bigger, there's more voices, there's more money, there's there's, there's bigger actors, that makes sense. and it's just everything like kind of I, I find in terms of the notes, the more money that's involved, the clearer everything has to be. You know what I mean? If it's a low budget film where there's not um, as much at stake, someone can kind of walk through a field like Terrence Malick, you know, there could be an American flag, like in slow motion or whatever. But it, if it's a bigger budget, then everything has to kind of be on the nose. Whereas, you know, indies can be a little bit, you know, closer to the cheek, I guess, or something, you know, it doesn't have to be as weird. It can be more interesting, more ambiguous. Uh, but ambiguity kind of pushes a bigger audience away and means it's less money. Um, so I, I found film is so much about money. Even with the, the, the small budget one we did, um, I turned in the first draft, I think 110 pages, and the first thing the director said, and she's amazing, she's incredible, she's you know smarter than me, more talented than me, everything. Um, she, uh, she said, every page over 100, this is gonna be a worse movie, because we're just not gonna have as much time, and we're not gonna have as much money. So she's like, you have to bring this in under 100. Huh. Um, so I was like, wow, okay. I mean, like, you're, of course you're gonna cut those pages when the movie's not gonna be as good if it's over 100, because every page in film essentially is one minute on screen. Um, and even for an independent film, that's about $10,000 a page. Um, so mm -hmm. it, it's like when, you, when you're writing the page and you're thinking about what's going on the page, and you're like, this is gonna cost $10,000. <laughs> you know, you really, everything becomes much more, uh, economic, I guess, you know, and you really, it really kind of heightens your writing almost to a point where you're like, well, maybe I don't need him to just pet his dog here and look into the sunset, <laughs> um, because that would cost us, you know, what, I don't know, I'd make in a semester of teaching a class or something, right? Uh, so it, it's just, it, it just really is a completely different way of thinking, you know, and just because, like, you write a good play, like, you can't assume you're gonna write a good movie. It's like saying I wrote a good book, so I'm gonna, so now I'm a poet, essentially. You know, and I, I do go back a lot to poetry because to me, I found that the words were kind of the least important part of the movie. Mm -hmm. um, the thing that I learned the most about the movie was, uh, I'm a huge outliner in terms of film um, on like the, the micro budget stuff I've worked on before is just like note carding every single scene. It usually comes out to about 60 note cards uh, for a feature film. And um, we had those note cards for revival. Then uh, they shot the movie, and lines changed, things changed. I went back and I looked at the note cards with my screenwriting class at UNO, and not none of the note cards ever changed. None of them at all. Everything in the movie changed, but not one of the note cards changed. And that just showed me how important that foundation of the outline is for film. Um, and how the dialogue really is just kind of there to disguise the intent of what's happening, because so much of it's action, you know, so much of it's about activating the scene. Um, and they want, they don't want to stay in one place too long. Um, so even if you only have five locations, which is great, it means the movie's gonna be cheaper, you only need five places to secure, they want you to hop around between those places so it feels like a bigger movie. You know, you're always trying to make it feel bigger uh, and look better than the, the money that you really have, I guess. Um, and 
then there's the festival circuit, which is like a whole different thing we're about to kind of experience. But, um, but yeah, I mean, I think it was rare because I had a really great experience my first time out in film just because the people I was working with were so smart, you know, and talented and kind of pure in a sense, you know. I'm sure, like, on the second film, like, everyone will be, like, jaded and smoking and wearing, you know, sunglasses and stuff, <laughs> leather jackets. But uh, the first film, like, was just, like, it was great. It was fun. I don't know. Any, do you want to, should we open it up to questions now? What do you think? Are you have anything else? Or? No, questions are good. <laughs> I have a question. Yes. So, these note cards, what, what was on, I forgot, what's your first name? Uh, Brett. Brett. What, so what was on these note cards? So, like, it's basically what I always tell the students um, in my class is, uh, also, like, if you want to study screenwriting, you know, we're starting a screenwriting program, uh, come sign up. Uh, you know when I'm going to say that. Um, so the note card, basically, I just write action on it, because film is action. And that's the most important thing. And I try to avoid act, uh, passive verbs, and I try to just write, if you can write it in one sentence, it's great, because the note cards are going to be changed constantly. Um, I Skyped the director, Jen, into class, who did the film, and she's, she's a huge advocate of the note cards now, because she did it, she went through the process with me, and, um, you know, we worked on the note cards for maybe three months, just completely throwing cards out, rewriting them, putting them in, throwing them out, putting them in, throwing them out, moving things around. And then I wrote the script in maybe two weeks, and maybe I did a polish after that. But the script is, like, the fun part. The work is really in kind of creating the foundation, the note cards. Like, I've always said that screenwriting is kind of poetry on top of numbers, and the numbers are the most important part of the script. And the numbers are the note cards. So you'd write, like, one scene would be us having a panel. So we're here, we have a panel, one sentence, no card. The next scene is us going to lunch. We go to lunch. The next scene is, you know, um, uh, a cousin dying or something, and then the movie starts, right? But it's, you want to put as little as you can on the note card because you're going to have to get rid of it. You know, like maybe the first 60 note cards you keep, maybe 10 or 15 of them uh, when, you're, when you're beating out a movie. Um, but that's where most of the work really comes in, I find at least, in terms of my process. So I wrote down 60. 16, yes. No, 16 would give you about uh, 30 minutes, probably through the first act. Yeah. Uh, I find that the first act is about 15 note cards, second act is 30, third act is uh, 10 to 15. You know, um, so you always want a little bit more than you need because you're always going to cut them back. Um, but you have to be ruthless with those note cards. And the most important thing I ever learned in terms of note cards came from uh, the writers of South Park, actually. And they said that it took them like five or six years to learn this. And um, what they finally realized was if a, if a card went, because this is how they outline their episodes, if a card went, this happens, and then this happens, and then this happens, it's not interesting and it doesn't work. But if the card goes, this happens, therefore this happens, therefore this happens, you have to have the word therefore, and that creates a forward momentum in film. It pushes you forward, and it makes you want to keep watching because you want to know what's going to happen next. Um, so that creates that forward propulsion, and it's incredibly hard to do. You know, sometimes you'll write six note cards, and you'll be like, this happens, therefore this down here happens, and we've got to get rid of these. But I also find that if you rewrite your note cards, if you spend one day rewriting note cards, it's going to save you maybe a month rewriting the script. Because it's so much easier to throw a card out than it is to throw out, you know, pages, or 10 or 15 pages. Um, so that's why I'm always advocating that you kind of do that, like, with my class, I don't know if anyone else teaches it this way, but it's all about those cards. And, you know, they can go through the whole semester, and if that's the only thing they have at the end, I'm confident they can go off and write their movie, because that's where the movie is, you know. And, and that was my experience on the film. Like, those are the things that never change. And those are the things that make people interested in the movie. They want to turn the page, and they want to keep watching. Um, just that forward propulsion. You know, it's movement. It's constant movement, and it's action and you're trying to find out what happens next. So you're always searching for that word, therefore, is what I found. I don't know. Yeah, this is my world, man, you know. Um, I, I went out to LA, and, and I live in LA now, and I went out to LA in 2001 after optioning one of my plays that I had adapted. Off a picked up by uh, Fox Searchlight, and um, shortly after getting out there, um, 
one of the producers at Fox called me and said, Lee, I, I, I feel a need to tell you something. You know, it's, no one's told you already. He said, I'm here in LA. He said, the screenwriter was on the lower end of the totem pole, just like you were saying. He said, in theater, the playwright is king. Not so in Hollywood. <laughs> you know, and everyone comes before the screenwriter. And, um, and surely, you know, I, that, that, I've lived to the, you know, you know, I've optioned for screenplays, been involved in um, developing two TV series. And none of them have gone to screen. Um, and that's, okay, that's fine, because that's what happens, you know. Oh, absolutely. Um, in the game, you know. Um, well, it's a different ballpark, you know, and you were talking about the note cards, yeah. Um, what I found was that as a playwright, you know, I think I have a pretty good grasp on, on character and, and dialogue and, you know, all that. But in Hollywood, it's all about structure. Absolutely. It's yeah. all about the structure of the script. And even with that first one, it's illegal, you know, your, your, your dialogue is better. We love the character, we love the story. Damn structure, man, <laughs> you know? And, I, and, and it took me time to like, I mean, it took me a while to actually like get my hand on it. And I felt like, I mean, being a playwright and, and having the creative license that we have as playwrights, I felt like, you know, that whole structure thing was, um, was well, kind of confining me, you know. It's got to happen by this has got to happen by page ten, and this has got to happen by page thirty, and you know. And it's like, well, we already know that, so you know, what's the point, you know? Um, but that's how they do things. I mean, they, they will like take a script and flip through it and look for those those signs, and if they're not there, that script gets tossed. Absolutely, yeah, it gets tossed. You know, and no matter how good the script may be in general, if the old things are not there, boom, it goes. You know, so um, it's a completely different way of thinking when you're working on it. You know, you it, have to, it, you're requiring a new art form. You really are, and especially I know with <laughs> when I adapted my first play, it's like I lost probably seventy five percent of the dialogue. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Like this line's got to go, cut, cut, cut. You know, because it's all about thinking and writing visually. And like you say, moving the story forward visually as opposed to how we think, you know, using dialogue and words, you know, it's like, no, you know, what's happening? How's it, how's it, how are you moving forward? Like I always that? say I hear a play, but I see a movie. Yeah. You know, when I'm working Well, that's it, yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. I got stories to tell about my, that's all I'm going to talk. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, so when you go, so I, have, so I have two questions, but uh, the first one is, um, with those 60 cards, you're talking about the arc of a single feature. How, how do you relate that to television where you might have like a A plot line and a B it's, plot line? And well, 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 TV's, it's completely dependent upon what the show is for. So if the show is for network, it's either a sitcom, it's either 30 minutes or it's an hour. If it's 30 minutes, everything has to be funny. There are three acts, that means you're selling three sets of commercials. So everything has to build toward that. If it's an hour, then you know they, they want it to be dramatic and they want like big things to occur, but no one can change in TV either. Like that's the difference between a play and a TV show. They want very, very, very little change unless it's the, the pilot episode because they want the characters to stay the same so they can make 100, 200 episodes of it. So that's why procedurals do really well because the characters don't change, but the stories change each week. So they're constantly looking for a vehicle to keep the characters from changing as little as possible. Whereas if you have a play, you're always looking, you're saying, how is every character different? At the end of a TV show, you're always looking, how are they all the same? <laughs> um, so we can then come back and do it again next week. Um, so it, it comes down to really commercials, whereas HBO, like, um, as, as uh, he was talking about, it's like a completely different experience, it seems like, because that's they're not selling anything. They've already sold HBO. You're paying for HBO, so they don't have to sell commercials. Uh, so you're just, they have to tell good stories, you know, and they have to keep people interested in the story, so it's a different, um, it's a different beast. I haven't worked for uh, HBO or Showtime or anything like that. Everything I've done has been, you know, selling moss and stuff for, uh, for TV. And so she could speak better to writing for that than I could. Yeah. Well, and great, great. And the second question was, once you have those sixty cards, like, okay, this is it. These are our sixty, and you're going in and writing the script. How do you, 
how do you think this is good fresh for you? Like, like, do the characters ever surprise you? Oh, or? yeah. Well, for me, the surprise always happens on the page. Like, you, I mean, it's going to be incredibly boring if you just transcribe that to the, the script. So you always have to kind of be open to, uh, you know, the changes. Like, and you, the note cards, you're doing everything right. The script, the mistakes you make, that's kind of your voice. You know, the, the mistakes you make in genre that work. So you want to just make sure that if you make mistakes on the page, they work. That makes sense. You know, I always tell my students to break the rules well. Like, you, you don't want very much dialogue and then look at a Tarantino movie. He breaks the rules really well because he writes really good dialogue. So it has to be toward that. So you still want there to be a life on the page. So you, you kind of look at it almost the cards as stepping stones. Like, this has got to happen, this has got to happen, this has got to happen. Now, how to get from here to here, that's going to be fun because we're just going to, we're going to jump. You know, that's the leap that you kind of make. It's a much smaller leap you're making in film than in theater because, like, theater, when you're writing a play, I feel like the entire play is a leap. You know, you're just jumping out and you don't know what's going to happen next. And you're kind of following the characters. Um, whereas in film, you're following the story. I don't know if that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> so um, your so the play that got seen was that in LA? Where where was the play? Oh, the play that got option? Yeah, or? no, the play where we, okay, let's see. They saw your play. Somebody saw your play, and yeah, the play that got option. Oh, the movie that was made. <laughs> yeah. Um, the, the way I first got into film was I had uh, my, my partner at the time, uh, her friend uh, brought her boyfriend who was a music video director who was going to direct like The Strangers 2 and he saw my play and he liked it and he brought me in to rewrite a project he was working on that never got made and through that I got into the film industry just a touch, you know, and there were people looking at different plays to think about optioning them and they found the one that they liked the best, which was Revival. And then it was optioned by two different companies, and then it finally came around, and then this group of people that are making a different movie said they'd make that first. So it's like, again, the one thing I'd say just in terms of getting into film, getting into TV, um, you never know how it's gonna happen. Noah Hawley even, he told me, he said, Hollywood is a party that no one will invite you to or let you come to. You have to break in, and then once you get there, everyone knows your name and they love you, and they're like, what took you so long? Basically, you know, so there's no straight line. There's no straight line to Hollywood. Like, there's no straight line to film or TV. So, is, so my, yeah. my uh, to go back to my. Oh, sorry. Yeah, no, that's all. That's great. Uh, what coast did this happen? Oh, East Coast. It was it was a play in New York. Um, so it was at uh, I think 5090, 5090, or 90. yeah, yeah. I always I always say it wrong. There's like there's two 59s and an E in there somewhere. Yeah. So it was uh, it was primary stages or no? It was it was a company called Project Y Theater Company. So it was a floater company that was using their right. uh, right. their stage. But yeah, it's, he ended up just seeing it. And that's how I got reality TV too. Uh, the director of one of my plays, his brother, was like an exec who saw a different play, and um, he brought me in to write trailers basically uh, for their company. And then from there, the guy liked one of the things I wrote. Uh, and then they put me on a show that was set in Omaha, actually, about the Illuminati for Sci-Fi Channel, where Warren Buffett was running the Illuminati, and I was like making all that up, and then Sci-Fi didn't pick it up, and then they put me on to uh, all things uh, Amish for a little while. You know, not that I've ever met an Amish person, not that I know anything about that. I, I apologize now to the entire Amish community for that part of my life. Um, but yeah, so it's just, it's, it's, again, it's never a straight line, you're just doing the best work you can, and, um, I've never done a play, and I feel like you probably feel the same, I've never done a play that I was proud of that hasn't led to something else. You know what I mean? It hasn't led to at least another production or a connection with someone that helped me get something else. I don't know, I always felt that. <laughs> at least in New York, it seemed that way. I don't know. <laughs> Any other questions? There's no reference to Barton Fink. <laughs> Screw. <laughs> All right, well, that's it. Thank you, Brendan.